fluid exchange within the capillary bed. There are two primary forces responsible for fluid movement across the capillary, hydrostatic pressure, that is the pressure generated by the heart, and osmotic pressure, the force generated by solutes within the blood. Hydrostatic pressure not only pushes blood through the vessels but also exerts force on the vessel walls. This pressure tends to move water out of the capillary into the interstitial space. The movement of water can occur across the plasma membrane of the endothelial cell, but it mostly travels through the perivascular spaces between endothelial cells. As water leaves the capillary bed, moving into the interstitial space, the hydrostatic pressure within the capillaries goes down, the driving gradient is reduced, and less water leaves the capillary bed. The second force, osmotic pressure, is exerted by osmatically active particles within the blood. This can be ions and nutrients. But an important contributor to osmotic force in the blood is the protein albumin. Because the proteins are the only dissolved constituents in the plasma and interstitial fluids that do not readily pass through the capillary pores, it is the proteins of the plasma and interstitial fluids that are responsible for the osmotic pressures on the two sides of the capillary membrane. Albumin is a normal circulating protein within the blood. At the capillary, albumin is a powerful attractor of water. As blood flows through the capillary bed, hydrostatic pressure moves some water out at the arterial end of the capillary network, and albumin and other osmotically active particles draw water back into the blood at the venous end. Throughout the capillary bed, these two forces are in dynamic opposition, and together they maintain fluid balance. There are two other forces that also contribute to vascular volume, tissue hydrostatic pressure and tissue osmotic pressure. The amount of water within the tissues will exert a hydrostatic pressure of its own, opposing the hydrostatic pressure generated by the heart, pushing blood against the capillary walls. This is one reason that more fluid leaves the capillaries at the arterial end of the capillary bed. The more fluid that leaves the vessels, the greater the tissue hydrostatic pressure will become. The second force, tissue osmotic pressure, is exerted by proteins and ions within the interstitial space. This force tends to pull water from the vasculature into the surrounding tissue. This force is generally small, but should capillaries become leaky, allowing protein into the interstitial space, this force can become significant. The average capillary pressure at the arterial ends of the capillaries is 15 to 25 mmHg greater than at the venous ends. Because of this difference, fluid filters out of the capillaries at their arterial ends, but at their venous ends fluid is reabsorbed back into the capillaries. Thus, a small amount of fluid actually flows through the tissues from the arterial ends of the capillaries to the venous ends. Actually, there is a small net loss of fluid from the capillaries to the interstitial fluid. This fluid moves primarily by interstitial hydrostatic pressure into the blind-ended lymphatic vessels. The lymphatic vessels have valves and move fluid from these terminal sacs along a low-pressure, fluid-filled third vascular space back to the venous circulation. During the transit, the fluid will pass through lymph nodes and the fluid will be monitored by the immune system. Independent of its role in the immune system, fluid recovery from tissues by the lymphatic system is essential. Malfunction of the lymphatic system, as in elephantiasis, where the lymphatic system is blocked by parasites, causes vascular fluid loss and tissue swelling. Do not forget to like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel.